Welcome to the study of God's Word with pastor and author Ed Taylor, recorded live from Calvary Chapel in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media, visit us online at calvaryaurora.org or download our free app on all platforms. And now, here's Pastor Ed to take us into our study. And take your Bibles out and open them to the book of Hebrews, chapter 1. As we continue our study through the book of Hebrews, we're reminded in this first chapter that Paul, as he's writing, is telling these first century Jewish Christians that Jesus is greater than the angels. I mean, the, the whole theme of the book is the, how better Jesus is to anything and everyone. However, in this first chapter, the focus has been on angels. And what a fascinating topic angels, how fascinating creatures angels are, let alone the study of them. And we spent some time looking at angels and then looking at these different reasons why Jesus is greater than the angels. If you're taking notes by way of review, we've already learned number one, why is Jesus greater than angels? Well, number one, he is deity. Jesus is God. Number two, Jesus has a unique father-son relationship with God. He's got a unique one unlike any of us. Number three, we learn Jesus is worshiped by angels. He doesn't worship angels. Number four, we know that Jesus, we learn that Jesus is the maker of angels. Angels didn't make Jesus, but Jesus made them. Number five, we learn that Jesus is the sovereign master who sits on the throne. Number six, we learn that Jesus possesses, and I love this one, he possesses a spotless integrity. And then the seventh thing that we learn is that Jesus is uniquely anointed by God. That was in verse 9. Notice Hebrews 1 verse 9. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness. Not the oil of sadness, but the oil of gladness more than all of your companions. Verse 10. And you, Lord, still speaking to the Son, and you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. And the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all grow old like a garment. Like a cloak, you'll fold them up, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not fail. Verse 13. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation, which brings us to number eight. Why is Jesus greater than the angels? Number eight is in verse 10. He is the creator of heaven and earth. He is the creator. We learned last time that he made the angels, but now there's an emphasis being made. He is the creator of heaven and earth. He is the creator, not a creator. And this again is a quote from the Old Testament. It's a quote from Psalm 102. Because the Bible that they have in their hands is the very thing that teaches them that Jesus is greater. Through all the prophecies, all the predictions, everything getting ready for the culmination of the coming of Messiah, it's all in the Old Testament. All of this stuff is not being made up on the fly, but rather it is rooted in God's Word. Which, by the way, is very important for you and me. If you want to find truth in the situation, it's in the Word of God. Like, if you want to find out what the answer is to the situation in your life, it's in the Word of God. If you want to find hope, it's in God's Word. If you want to find truth, it's in God's Word. If you want to find joy and peace and direction, the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And isn't that where we fail? Leaning on our own understanding. Even if we try to baptize it with a scripture and try to put some spiritual language on it, it's still just leaning on your own understanding. The reality is, is that when we trust the Lord with all of our heart, leaning not on our own understanding, acknowledging Him in all our ways. How do we do that? Well, we acknowledge Him through prayer. We acknowledge Him in our mind. We invite Him into the situation. And we acknowledge Him by trusting what He said in His Word and obeying it. Jesus put it this way. He said it very simply. Two guys build a house, experience the same storms. One, his house was destroyed by the storms, and he found out that the foundation of his house, which is a picture of life, was on sand. And nobody in their right mind is going to build their dream house on sand. And, and the, the, the house that made it through the storms, it was founded on the rock. 
I mean, if you go through these two houses, they would look the same. They would, they would appear the same. And then the same storm comes through and one completely falls. It was built on sand. One stays strong. It was built on the rock. And Jesus, he said this, you want a house that's built on a rock, this is what you do. It refers to those that hear God's word and do it. Amen. Hear God's word and do it. That's where truth is found. You see, Jesus is greater than the angels because he's the creator. And do you know the root of every issue in your life? Do you know the root of this rebellious culture that we're in, this rebellion? Do you know all the sin that's in this room, all the mistakes that are ma being made, all the rebellion, all the resistance? You want to know where the root of it is? Let me tell you. It's a failure for you to acknowledge this simple truth. Because God, in his revelation of himself, remember, we can't know anything about God unless he chose to reveal himself to us. Like, he doesn't say, go figure it out, go up to the mountains, go to the beach, go to the lake, go to the reservoir, and just search for me your whole life, and maybe you'll find me. That's not what God says. God says, if you search with me, you'll be found. I'll be found by you, saith the Lord. The Bible says that. God says, if you search for me, you'll find me. You don't have to run around because he has revealed himself to us. He's revealed himself to us. And here's, here's the summary of that revelation. If you had to summarize the Bible in one sentence, just, just the revelation of God in one sentence, it would be something like this. God says, and I quote, I am God and you are not, end quote. That's really the root of the matter. When you and I choose sin, we are simply saying, I don't believe that you're God. I believe that I'm a better God than you. Little g, of course. I believe that my way is better than your way, God. I believe that my thoughts are better than yours. I believe I can handle this situation my way. I believe that I can solve the problems in my own mind and my own resources. And we fail to acknowledge that God is God and you and I, we are not. We are not. Look at your neighbor and say, God is God and you are not. Go ahead, just tell them. They need to know. Say it out loud. All right, now turn the other way because you got to hear it too. So say it the other way. You're not God. Can I get an amen? You're not God. You're not God. And even if you were, you'd be a bad God. We wouldn't want to follow you. You'd be a false God and we'd have to destroy you. <laughs> You're not God. And isn't that the root of every issue? We don't trust him. We don't listen to him. We don't follow him. We explain him away. We go our own way. We, like sheep, have gone astray, the Bible says. All to each his own way. Jesus is the creator. We're the creation. We owe him everything. He owes us nothing. He's greater than the angels in every way, but he's the creator. He's the beginning and the end, the author and the finisher. He's the sovereign ruler. What power Jesus possesses. He has the power to launch into space more worlds than man could even count. They're still trying to catch up with how many celestial bodies are up there in space. They don't have no idea. They always, oh, I found another one, I found another one. I know, you can search for a billion, million years and you're still gonna keep finding God's creation. He's that vast. In John chapter 1, verse 3, it says, All things were made through him, Jesus. All things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness doesn't understand it. The light that shined in the darkness was this light. I am God, and you are not, Jesus would say to us today. Number nine. Why is Jesus greater than the angels? Well, notice in verse 11, it says, of the foundation of the earth, the heavens and the work of his hands, verse 11, they will perish, but you remain. They will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak, you'll fold them up, and they'll be changed, but you are the same, your years will not fail. Number nine, Jesus is eternal. Creation is temporary, Jesus is eternal. The scientists call this, as things are winding down and coming to an end, they call it entropy. Uh, everything wearing down. The suns, the stars of space will perish. They are perishing, but God remains unchanged. 
And, and I'm not an expert on this, but I did look some things up. And here's basic understanding of entropy. Motion produces friction, friction produces wear, and wear produces disintegration. And as one author put it, the whole universe is like a vast clock slowly running down. I mean, our only, just take example of our sun, the energy that our sun loses every second. That our sun loses 4.2 million tons of heat every second. Every second, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Our bodies are wearing down. Can anybody agree with that? Our bodies are not what they used to be. I'm, a, I'm going around, I get to meet these babies. I did a baby dedication. They, they've got their whole, man, their bodies, oh, they're still going to grow into their bodies. Me? My body's wearing out, man. It hurts. It's sore. And as I've shared with you many times before, just a little, it makes noises I never knew it could make. <laughs> and I know some of you are still so young and, oh, you know, my body's going to be fine. You just wait. You just wait. One day it's going to be, whoa, what happened there? Entropy. That's what happened. <laughs> Things are winding down. Things are not what they used to be. There, there is going to be a day when all of creation will be gone and a new heaven and a new earth will be given to us by God. It's all winding down. I mean, everything. A cars are, I mean, I was, I, Marie and I joke about this, but you know, we've been in the same house for a while since, almost since we moved here, same house. But, but man, I'm t I, don't, I mean, I can't say, I was about to say I'm tired of fixing things, but I don't really fix anything in the house. So <laughs> I'm tired of things breaking down. Because every breaking down, and then I get a, oh, hey, Ed, you won't believe this broke down. Oh, Ed, you need to fix this. And, all. and I'm like, every time I hear something breaking down, I'm like, it's time to move, man. I want to move to a place where I don't have to fix anything. And Marie will say, well, you are in a place where you don't, have to, you don't ever fix anything anyway. And I know, I know, I know. So go fix it. Take care of it. You're the one that knows how to do it. No. She loves me. Don't be mistaken. But I mean, even my own house is breaking down. Cracks in the concrete and... And every single year, my sprinklers freeze. I don't care what I do. I could go out there. I mean, and I take good care of my house. Don't miss it. I come home, oh, nice house, nice house. I'll protect you from the woodpeckers, and I'll protect, you know, nice. And it just still keeps breaking down. Why? Entropy, entropy. But, you know, all of the world is breaking down. Don't you see it? Do you see the world with spiritual eyes? Do you see the world of the, the destruction of sin? how it's all winding down, how things aren't getting better and better. They're getting worse and worse. The depravity of man is becoming more depraved. And I mean, we're, we're, in, a, we're in a tough culture. And, and, and here he says, and compared to the creation that won't last, Jesus, he says in verse 12, your years will not fail. But this, I, this truth of like a cloak, it'll all be folded up. The... the heavens and the work of your hands, the foundation, will all perish. It's referring to a point in time, something known as the day of the Lord. Would you turn over to 2 Peter chapter 3 with me, please? 2 Peter chapter 3. Peter, one of Jesus' best friends, teaches us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit about this time known as the day of the Lord. 2 Peter chapter 3, pick up with me in verse 8, would you? Chapter 3, verse 8. Peter's writing, he says, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. God lives in the eternal. You and I live in the constricted by time. That's what he, really what he's saying there. Verse 9. The Lord is not, this is such a beautiful verse. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that, what does your Bible say? any, say it out loud, any should perish, but that, say the next word, all. So mark those words, any and all, because they apply to your moms and your dads. They apply to your kids, to your cousins, to your co-workers that are yet to be saved. It's not God's will that they perish, but they are ones that are any and all. Don't forget that, any and all. Don't be ripped off by some theology that says that Jesus Christ only died for a certain group and another group is just going to hell. Jesus died for anyone that would believe. He's not willing that anyone would perish. And you say, well, Ed, why are people perishing? Because they are rejecting God. It's not God's fault. 
Do you know the links at which God went to save your soul, to get your attention, to demonstrate his love? I mean, God in who came and put on a human body, a broken body just like yours, a body that was subject to limitations. Here's God in all the, God the Son in all of his glory he comes down and becomes one of us, fully God and fully man. And his reward? Well, his reward was to be falsely accused and lied about. His reward was to hire people to lie about him, convince the government to, to beat him, and they viciously beat him over and over again. Right before the cross, they, two Roman soldiers would beat him full force on his back. They would take this bloody, mangled body who's still alive. Jesus endured the whole beating and put it on a Roman cross where he would hang and die a slow death. And he died. They put a crown of thorns on his head and twisted it into his skull. They spit on him. They slapped him open-handed without him being able to see. That's how they treated love. They treated love with rebellion and with, with sickness and depravity. Why does someone go to hell? Because they choose to. They choose not to accept the love of God. God went to great lengths to tell you, to reveal to me that he loves us, that he didn't wait for us to clean things up. He didn't wait for us to stop partying or stop drinking or stop smoking pot or stop doing drugs, stop lying. He didn't, he didn't, stop, he didn't say, okay, when you guys, as soon as you stop all your bad behavior, then maybe, just maybe, I'll reveal myself to you. He did the exact opposite of what we would expect. In our worst condition, in our worst decisions, in the, the hardest time of our life was when his love exploded upon us. The Bible puts it this way, while we were still yet dead in our trespasses and sin, Christ died for who? The ungodly. That's you and me. He didn't wait for things to be cleaned up. He entered into our messed up life to rescue and redeem us. And so many of us have taken the free gift of salvation. It doesn't merit any work on your part. You don't earn what God has for you. You can't work for it. You can never be good enough. All you need to do is accept and receive. Admit your broken condition. Jesus is eternal. And he has gone to great lengths to reveal to you and to me how much he loves you. He's gone to great lengths so that you might know of his mercy and his grace and his goodness. He, he has, you could say, pulled out all the stops so you'd understand how patient he is, how much he loves your family. Why is he, you, you wonder, why hasn't he come back yet? Well, his, 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 his delay is what we see as a delay. Understand that the, the coming of the Lord is a fixed time, but what we perceive as a delay is actually the patience of God because he loves your family and he loves your kids and he loves your grandkids and your mom and dad. He loves your boss. And he loves you. And he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Notice, read on in 2 Peter chapter 3. He says, so, so verse 9 is like a beautiful verse, and then verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up that's what's being described in Hebrews, the day of the Lord. It'll come surprisingly to people. They won't, they won't be ready for it. Notice verse 11, therefore, because the day of the Lord's going to come, and it is and imminently, since all these things will be dissolved, what kind of people should you be? What kind of people should you be? And he gives you four things. These are the kind of people we should be. Number one, we should live in holy conduct. Number two, we should live in godliness, reflecting God in our lives. I mean, I'm telling you, the world and the church, and, and let's, not, let, let's not just broadcast it like broadly. I, I just don't understand why so many believers, they look like the world. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Perhaps that's even in your life right now. We wouldn't even be able to tell the difference. Believers are divorcing just like everyone else. Believers are going out partying. Believers are doing things that don't reflect anything of the godliness of God. They, they don't reflect, here you are, I follow God, but actually in your life you deny him. Why? Why is that your life? Why do you think that's God's will for you? 
Why do you think it's going to get you where you really want to go? I mean, the divorce rate among those that say they're Christians is skyrocketing. I talked to somebody not too long ago. We were talking about an imminent divorce. And just so you know, if you ever come to me before divorce happens, I'm going to beg you not to do it. I'm going to remind you what the Bible says. I'm going to tell you to put the work in. Submit to the Lord. I'm going to give you all, I'm going to open a Bible and then just, so, and then you might, well, I'm not going to come to you. Well, then don't come to me. The Holy Spirit will chase you. You don't get away from him. And so not too long ago, I was talking to someone and they're, they've got this decision. Should I stay in my marriage or go with this new person? And so I, I look him in the eye and I said, what are you going to do? And they said, I'm going to pray about it. And I said, you're going to pray about that? You're going to pray about what you already know the answer of God's word is? You know what that sounds like? Sounds like the world. What are you going to do? Whatever I want. That was the answer. And you say, well, what happened, Ed? What happened? I don't know yet. I hope that the truth that was given, and I hope if that person decides to pray, that heaven screams, what are you doing? What are you doing? Oh, maybe it's not divorce for you. You fill in the blanks of just how much the church and the world look alike. And remember, church is not a building. We're the church. You're the church. So it's not reflected in worship style or song selection or color of paint. Or, that's not the church. The church is you and me. And the day of the Lord is coming. And the day of the Lord is not is not a good time. It reflects the wrath and the judgment of God. That day is coming where this world will be dissolved, rolled up, burned away. It's temporary. Jesus Christ is eternal. And the day of the Lord is a day of judgment, a day that is described more in the Bible than just about any other topic. And you jot it down, Isaiah chapter 2, Joel chapter 2, Isaiah chapter 26, 2 Peter 3. It's all over the Bible, this day of judgment. Sometimes it's called uh, the day of the Lord. Sometimes it's called Jacob's trouble. In the New Testament, we see it as referred to, lived out in the great tribulation period, Revelation chapter 6, verse 19. And it is true that I believe Jesus Christ will come and rapture the church to himself before the great tribulation period. Why? Because the Bible says that believers have not been appointed to wrath that Jesus Christ himself took upon himself the wrath of God in exchange for your sins and mine. That the judgment, the full weight and penalty of sin was paid for by Jesus Christ. He didn't leave not even a small part of it. It's been taken away by his blood and proven by his resurrection. And so even as I know everybody likes to debate on when the rapture is and what time, but even wherever you fall, just understand this. The day of the Lord is coming. And it will be shocking to everyone who experiences it. It's going to come like a thief. What kind of people should we be living in godliness? What type of people should we be? We should be men and women that are growing in godliness, growing in our holy conduct. We shouldn't be making fun of it. We shouldn't be laughing at it. We should be living in greater ways of submission. We should, no, no, look in verse 12, we should look for his coming and hasten the coming of the great day of God. Look for. You know, I thought of a great illustration of looking for something. Anybody ever lose their keys? Before an appointment? Got to get out the door. Where are my keys? I just happen to be one of those people that freaks out when I lose my keys. Because I think of all the horrible things that can happen if somebody finds my keys. And what about this key? And I've got the church key. And I go, oh, where's my keys? In your pocket, Ed. Oh, yeah, they're in my pocket. Or, I mean, I'm not selling these or anything, but I want you to know this little white thing actually helps a lot because on my phone, when I lose my keys, I can push a little button. And if these keys happen to be in my house, it will sing a little song to me. And it's a sweet little song. I tried to demonstrate it last night. I can't get it to work. But that, I, I lose my keys. I lose my wallet. Sometimes I lose my mind. But when I lose something, I'm pretty paranoid about finding it. 
Well, I don't want to say paranoid because then you guys are like, what a crazy pastor you are. I am, but <laughs> I just like, man, where's my keys? And Marie's just sitting over there. You'll find them. And please don't ever do this again. Somebody says, I lost my keys. Don't do this. Don't ask them. Where did you lose them? <laughs> like seriously, if I knew where I lost them, we would not be having this conversation right now. Seriously, don't do that. Where did you last see them? I have no idea because if I knew they'd be in my hand. Looking for the day. Are you looking for the return of Jesus Christ, church? Are you looking for him to come and rescue and redeem and to live in the fullness of his presence? Are you looking? So I have Saturday and Sunday. We had service last night. I had this message on my mind. I've been meditating on it. And I woke up yesterday morning, and one of the first thoughts in my mind was looking for the coming of the Lord. It was on my mind. I had two things on my mind. One, I'm praying for a family in a very serious family situation right now. First thing on my mind, around the same time, oh, Lord, if you, you know, and I started thinking of problems and thinking, oh, Lord, this, and oh, Lord, this situation. Even in my own life, if you would just come back now, everything would be solved. It would just be so good to be in your presence. I'm looking for you to come. Yesterday, I was able to tell Saturday night service, yeah, man, you pastors walking in the Spirit, so thinking of the Lord. Then Sunday morning came. Today, set my alarm early, but I woke up way before my alarm. And I woke up. You know the first thing on my mind? What time is it? So I go over and tap my watch there on the side, and I was like, it's four o'clock. Second thing on my mind, I'm going back to sleep. I roll over, go to sleep, Wake up again, tap my, it's 4.05. What am I doing? I'm going back to sleep. I mean, five, I mean, anybody ever do that? Every five, say five minutes of sleep at a time is fine with me, man. I'll take it. And then finally, I couldn't fall back to sleep. About 4.30, I get up. I go downstairs and work out. And I, and, and I, didn't, really, I didn't really think of the coming of the Lord until first service. Really, truly. Like, it wasn't on my mind. I was caught up with working out, then I got up this morning and did my devos. And even though I did my devos, I, I was in the Word reading about Jesus and temptation and such, but I wasn't thinking about His coming. I, I was thinking about coming here. And I was thinking about it, being on time. And I was thinking, of, I had a lot on my mind, but I wasn't looking for the coming of the Lord. It's that, it can slip away that fast. You know, we live in this culture. This culture is just pressing in on us, pressing in on us, pressing in on us. And, and because we're in the culture, we don't always see it. It's like a fish in water. You know, you talk to a fish about water, like, what are you talking about? That's what I live in. Like, I, I don't understand how you're... And because of our culture, you know, we live in our culture, we don't always see it. And our culture tends to lull us to sleep with stuff and things. You see, Jesus is eternal. He's going to outlast your things. One of the great disappointments so many of us are going to experience is that we're going to come to the end of our life and find out that all this stuff really wasn't worth it. It's better to learn it earlier, but one day we're going to learn it. You know, those of you that have poured your life into your career and sacrificed everything on the altar of career, you're going to come to one day, you're going to find out it wasn't worth it. Or accumulating things, because there's so much stuff to accumulate, isn't there? So much stuff. I just noticed they built a brand new storage thing. It was like so tall, like it's huge. Where, where's all this stuff coming from? Our basement and garages, that's where it's coming from. We're just accumulating. And now, you know, you can collect money and you can collect gold and you can collect silver. Now you can collect Bitcoin. And you can grab this and we can put this and we're going to plan for this and we're going to get this and we're going to buy this and we're going to grab this. And before you know it, you just find out, man, none of this stuff matters. It's done nothing for eternity. It isn't furthering the gospel. Listen, stuff is rather neutral, quite frankly. The Bible definitely teaches us to stay, save and plan ahead. The Bible teaches us to have a roof over our head, take care of our family. It's very neutral. The issue is the heart. What do you do with the stuff? If you're just accumulating stuff, accumulating stuff, you know, remember Jesus gave that parable, a guy got a barn, he, got, he had so much stuff, he had to build another barn, put all the stuff in, and then what happened? He says, you know, today or tomorrow, your, day, your life is going to be required of you. And what's going to happen when our lives are required of us? We're leaving all our stuff behind. I've, I've had the privilege and honor over the years to be at the bedside of those 
that are just moments away from entering into eternity, the bedside of those that are dying, hospice, home, hospitals. And in our conversation about life, about the future, to this date, I haven't spoken to any believer that would say, you know, Pastor, one of my regrets is I didn't get enough stuff. I wish I could have got more stuff. You know, I had this goal and I I never was able to reach that goal because I had one, but I wanted two and I never got two. Never, no one's ever shared that with me. No no one's ever shared a regret of, of living in a small house when they could have had a bigger, nobody ever mentions it, but I'll tell you what they do mention. You know what, pastor? I wasted my life. I neglected my family. I neglected my God. And I need to open up the Bible to them and remind them that in Jesus Christ, there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ. I need to remind them that God is going to accept them and receive them. And I always share with them, you know what? I'm going to share your story one day. I'm going to share this moment like I am with you right now. I'm going to warn the living that there's still life to be lived for the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, if you're able to make money, you make it for the kingdom of God. If you know your way around in real estate, then you do that for the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus said. It's all about priorities. It's not about the stuff. It's about priorities. Jesus put it this way in Matthew chapter 6. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these things will be added. But it's flipped upside down so much. And because of this culture, if there's one thing this culture has done good to us, it's this, given us the false hope of tomorrow. There's always tomorrow. Hey, let's get busy for the things of God. No, tomorrow. Hey, let's go, let's go raise our kids in the ways of the Lord. Tomorrow. Let, let's make sure that, that, we, that we serve God. Maybe tomorrow. And this culture is always getting us to think about tomorrow. And while we're worried about tomorrow, we lose today. And then we lose the next day while we're all worried about what's going to happen tomorrow. And then our kids grow up right, behind, right before us. All the stuff we accumulate rusts and breaks down. Seek first the kingdom of God. He's eternal. Your stuff isn't going to make it. We're just passing through this earth. It's just temporary. Even we ourselves are going to get new bodies. Jesus is preparing for us a place right now. And he said, if I go and prepare a place, I'll come back for you. See, the day of the Lord is a day of judgment. It's a day of finality. It's a day that says, everything I told you is true, Jesus says. And now, Judgment will come upon the sinner. Read Isaiah chapter 26. And tell me if that sounds like judgment to a believer. It's to an unbeliever. How do we hasten the coming of the Lord? You know, this word hasten has been misunderstood by many theologies. It's actually a real popular theology. It's called kingdom now theology. And it's very popular within the the faith movement today. Most of the teachers on TV. and, And it basically goes something like this. We're going to hasten the coming of the Lord with the idea, because hasten can sometimes be interpreted and defined as make something happen faster. That's not the definition of this word in particular, because you're not going to be able to make the coming of the Lord come faster. But some people, some people have created a theology that says, okay, look, we're going to hasten the coming of the Lord because the, as soon as the church gets perfect, and as soon as the church gets completely pure, then the Lord will come back. And so what's happened is we've, they have made the coming of God dependent upon man. And as I share with a brother after first service, you always know a false teaching when it makes man the center. As if Jesus is waiting for us to come back. Oh, I hope they get their act together. I hope they finally get perfect. Can I go now? Can I? No, not yet. Can I? Okay, okay. How close are they? I mean, can you imagine if Jesus was waiting for you to come back? He'd never come. How would you ever become perfect apart from his righteousness? He'd never come. See, the coming of the Lord is a fixed in time. He knows, we don't. And because we don't, we live life for him daily. The promise of tomorrow, hey, it may or may not come. That's the thing. That's the thing. We we, we are not promised tomorrow. 
and neither do we know how many tomorrows we have. And so the Bible says live for today. Today is the day. Now is the time. Seize the day, as many have said. He's eternal. He's greater than the angels because he is eternal. Finally, as we wind down chapter 1, we learn in verse 13, back in Hebrews, that Jesus is exalted. He's exalted to the right hand. Notice in verse 13, to what angel did God ever say, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? If you'd like to write in your Bibles, you can just write next to it, no angel. There is no angel that God ever said or ever will say, sit at my right hand. But to the Son, that's where he's at. Remember the right hand is a position of love and joy and honor and dignity and triumph and victory and rule and authority and power and sovereignty, responsibility and duty, justice and judgment. The right hand is a very important place. Jesus has finished his work on the earth, finished the work of salvation on the cross as a faithful and obedient son, the son of God, He died and was buried and rose again and ascended into heaven. Now he's at the right hand of the Father. And no time in all of human history, past, present, or future, has God or will God ever tell an angel, sit at my right hand. Only Jesus has. It's reserved for Jesus and him alone. There was an angel that thought it was his. His name was Lucifer, Satan. Remember, there's a lot of names for this guy. And he tried to usurp God's authority. His reward was to be kicked out of heaven for the demonic rebel that he was. That place and position is taken and reserved for Jesus Christ and Jesus only. But there are angels around the throne. Did you know that? Turn over to Revelation chapter 5, and this is where we'll end. Angels, as majestic as they are, still are just serving, ministering saints. They, They just serve the saints. They serve God. God tells them what to do, and they do it. But we are heirs of salvation, those that believe in Jesus. Angels are not lords, but servants. They're not heirs. They're created beings for a purpose. They exist for one thing and one thing only, to carry out the perfect will of Jesus Christ. And so what what do the angels do when they're at the throne? Well, notice with me, Revelation chapter 5, verse 11. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures, The elders, the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Hundreds of millions and millions of angels there. And notice what they're saying with a loud voice. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom, strength and honor and glory and blessing. Then that moved every creature which is in heaven and on the earth, under the earth. Such are in the sea and all that are in them I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the church of Jesus Christ here today say, Amen. Amen. The angels are worshiping, esteeming glory and honor and praise to the Lamb, Jesus Christ. Jesus is so much better than the angels. And we just learned 10 things that make him better, but there's so much more that make him better. He is alone worthy to be praised and honored and followed. I pray you would do that today. So Father, as we turn our attention towards you and ask you to solidify and bring home these truths in our hearts, we happen to live in a time where angels aren't really elevated above you too much. I mean, maybe sometimes they are in the spiritual realm or, you know, people like that, that don't believe in you kind of live in the, you know, spirituality and things. But, but it's good to be reminded of your exalted position, how reliable and faithful you are. And I pray, God, forgive us for looking like the world around us instead of making a difference, living holy lives of godliness. Who are we to bring such shame upon your name? Forgive us, God. Forgive us for doing our own thing and thinking that we're the God of our lives. Forgive us for accepting your loving gift of salvation, but then living like we're still in control. And I know I touched 
on some things, God, that no doubt are in this room right now, no doubt are in the car, the people listening on the radio, they're, your word extended out. And, and I just pray right now, God, for those that have a decision to go left towards sin or right toward you, they don't need to pray about it. They just need to do it. Decide to obey. Why? Because you're working in them both to will and to do for your good pleasure. Forgive us for making excuses. Forgive us, God, for, you know, putting spiritual language on something that's obvious. We know what to do. We know what should be done. And for the rebel and the wanderer, for the hurting, for the weary and the tired, the lonely and the sad, would you pour out your spirit upon us, God, that we would receive a fresh anointing of your presence in our lives, that we would be established in our walk with you, that we would make the same decisions in the midst of a trial like Daniel did in the lion's den, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did in the fire, that we would not pull away when tough times come, but we would press in so that we could see, God, you close the mouth of lions. And we could see, God, that you burn away that which binds us. And I pray, God, you would just release from men and women today from bondage, God, from slavery to sin, God, from tormented minds, from fearful, anxious thoughts. God, would you just rem bring a great revelation so that we, like the angels in your presence, would cry out praise, glory, and honor to you? That, God, you would take our thoughts and capture them. That we would fix our minds on you, our great champion, our anchor, our hero. God, you're the, you're the faithful one. And even though everything's passing away, your years will go unchanged. You'll go on and on and on. If we were to wait another billion, billion years, when you return, you will be the same. If you're here today, you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I want to invite you to do just that. That today you recognize the great gift of God and his love for you. I know every time I, use, every time I begin to describe it, man, I, I don't have the right vocabulary to do it. But you know the Spirit of God does. And he's revealed to you the broken condition of your life. The conviction of sin. Just like standing before a judge when you're convicted. You just feel, you know what, I'm not right with God. And yet at the same time, God will reveal to you his mercy and forgiveness. That no matter where you've been and what you've been into, God is ready to forgive you. And so today, if that's you, you'd say, Ed, I need the forgiveness of God in my life. I want to follow him. I want to be born again. I want a new life in Christ. If that's you, would you stand to your feet? I want to pray with you. Like I said, today's the day. God bless you right here. Who else would say that's me? Today is the day. God bless you guys. Now is the time. Don't put it off for tomorrow. Seriously. Nobody's guaranteed tomorrow. I'm not trying to scare you or anything. That's not it at all. I just want you to know that you can experience the love of God right now. And it's not something to keep putting off. Because in a very real way, I can say with authority that you don't know what a day will bring. We don't know the end. God bless you in the back. Maybe on the radio, I don't see you, of course. Down in the overflow. Today's the day. And so just ask God. You know, the Bible says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So, so just with the opportunity to do that, you can say something like this with God. You could say, God, I come to you today and I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. I believe, Jesus, you live for me, died for me, and I believe you rose again from the dead to save my soul. And I commit to following you today. I ask you for help, God, to turn away from my sinful past. I renounce it. 
turn from it. And I look forward to what my new life in Christ will really be. And Father, those that turn to you today, those that come to you, God, pour out an abundance of love in their lives right now that they might be embraced by the Father, encouraged by the Son, empowered by the Spirit. Lord, move in a powerful way as today is the day of the change of the rest of their lives. And for us, God, encourage us and strengthen us as we head out to be the loving lights that you desire us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Aurora. For prayer or a copy of this study, call us at 877-30-GRACE. That's 877-304-7223. Or visit us online at calvaryaurora.org. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.